Raul Ruiz, the House Energy and Commerce uh, Committee hearings that they were conducting yesterday with oil executives about the high gas prices. Um, and here he is addressing some of the top executives in the country, asking them about those high gas prices. Madam Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now I'm pleased to recognize Mr. Ruiz for five minutes. Thank you, Chair, for holding this hearing on a critical issue on the top of my mind and my constituents' mind. In my district last week, I saw prices between $5.49 and $6.40 a gallon. These prices are outrageous, and my constituents are struggling at the pump and struggling to make ends meet. I hear from constituents who tell me how the outrageous gas prices are putting everything out of reach. They tell me that they're struggling to afford the gas just to go to work. I'm curious, on your salaries, do any of you have trouble affording the gas to get to your job? I didn't think so. And as this graph behind me based on research shows, while American families are struggling with high gas prices, you and your big oil corporations are making record profits choosing to keep supply low instead of investing oil in production in the 9,000 unused permits, you choose to make more profits for shareholders. During this mm -hmm. Russian war, you are ripping the American people off and it must end. Gas prices need to go down. And while the rest of America is trying to make um, so uh, he hits on a lot of good points there. Basically, he's I, I don't know if he later says this, but they stop. He stopped short of talking about how these oil corporations are price gouging because that's exactly what they're doing. They're taking the scarcity or the, the like largely artificial scarcity from uh, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine and in inflating the importance of that and then increasing the price of oil to then give kickbacks to their shareholders, stock buybacks for their executives. All the while, all while they take tens of millions of dollars in subsidies from the, our government in order to keep gas prices at a level that's affordable for uh, for people in this country. Because on, unfortunately, we have yet to break our dependence on fossil fuels. So they're not only taking taxpayer money, they're also using this conflict in Russia or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, in order to make themselves richer. This is disaster capitalism at its finest. Hello? Yeah. Oh, all I right. Mean, you, 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 you I guess hit, I nailed it on the so head. Yeah, I mean, hard. Well, that you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I don't know what else to add there. I mean, All right, well, then let's let's go to this other what clip I, what then. I say, though, oh, okay. I mean, in like, you know, in some ways, though, I'm, I'm glad that he's saying it. But also we, we constantly hear politicians, uh, Democrats especially, and that's good because they should be doing this, you know, talk about these issues like uh, and they lower telling the oil and gas companies to lower gas prices. And but it's like, you know, what, what, what do you expect? Like this is this is literally the world that you've helped create. Like, yeah. well, this is the system we live in. And this is, you know, you're against anything that would actually uh, you know, reconfigure or recalibrate the way everything currently works. Like, you know how we make sure that we don't price gouge? We nationalize the oil and gas companies. We make yeah. sure that uh, there aren't corporations and CEOs and shareholders uh, who are being put front and center, but the American people are. I mean, you know, how, how many how, how many times are we going to hear this same thing without any real solution offered? I mean, uh, good for him. I'm pointing this stuff out. But in the end, what his uh, end game to help his constituents is, is please oil and gas companies, listen to me and lower your gas prices. Not yeah. going to work. It's not going to work. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. I, you go ahead, Brandon. I was going to say, yeah, I think a lot of Democratic Party strategy seems, especially with stuff like this or when Elizabeth Warren goes after various sort of uh, monopoly interests, you just see like this kind of strategy of well, we're going to leave the incentive structure on the table that makes that makes this make financial sense for yourself, for your investor. And then we're going to try like the blame and shame game. And I think for a lot of people yeah. who have like an ego and like a dignity and like certain types of pride, they think of how embarrassing it would be to be yelled at on television in front of like the entire country. But for like a billionaire who's going to make a more billion dollars next year, it doesn't mean as much to them. And so like the question of like how 
you know, how uh, practical is it to continue to have these sort of revolving doors of like, you know, CEOs, whether it's Jamie Dimon or Mark Zuckerberg or various oil industry execs coming in just to be like performatively shamed in front of the country if it doesn't actually lead to any real like material difference in the way we actually like, you know, tackle the negative incentive structure that's causing this behavior to be that way. Well, it's like what kind of what we talked about with Luke here is there's a section of Democrats that feel like politics is just making people feel good in performing actions of like uh, catharsis and public shaming of of Republicans or going against Fox News and stuff, which, again, there is value to it. Right. I mean, making it clear that this isn't um, the just inertia and the way that of, that things have to be because of what Russia's uh, doing in Ukraine is, I think, an important point. You could also make the point, if you wanted to, uh, that part of the reason that, um, you know, wait, tr Trump's uh, sanctions against Venezuelan oil still exist, by the way. Um, and the um, meta or the, the, the point that um, is more overreaching and I, the one that I wish Democrats would pivot to immediately after every uh, every time gas prices come up is that this is why this is unsustainable. This is why we need a Green New Deal. Sell your agenda that's also going to help the, the planet with every breath you take when it comes to talking about oil and gas prices. That's what you have to do. And that's your responsibility as a Democrat, like not to just, you know, shame executives, put alternative legislation on the table. So the these you know, disaster capitalists don't have the opportunity to do this anymore. Yeah, if you don't want us to uh, take Venezuelan oil, uh, give us a Green New Deal. Um, and the other a good question to ask, and, and I agree, like I think this, the, the fundamental problem with the performative nature of this is exactly why Pelosi puts the squad on the House Oversight Committee and no other ones. You know it's, that's it, a pet peeve of mine. And it's, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. But I will just say like on, on this sort of front, that, that's a good question, and it's a good question to ask rich people in general, and uh, particularly capitalists, is um, not only like, are you having trouble affording your ability to get to work, but what are you having trouble affording? What have you had trouble affording at any point in the last decade that Americans have gone through, like the housing crisis and all this stuff? Um, what have you had trouble affording? And the answer for any sort of super rich person is either nothing or really embarrassing uh, something about uh, like houses or vacations. Yeah. Um, and like that's the problem with the world today is that we have all these problems and insulated from any sort of sacrifice to meet the um, meet those problems is wealthy people, people who make passive income. Yeah. There's a shortage of mega yachts, actually. Don't forget that. I and my heart breaks. <laughs>